This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. We have Mr. Scott H. Miller. Scott Miller is a ANS Life Fellow and author of Medallic Art of the American Numismatic Society, 1865 to 2014, as well as numerous articles on metals. Uh, he has presented at three COACs in the past uh, and is currently working on a catalog resume of the work of Victor David Brenner. Born in Brooklyn, New York, Scott is a retired federal civil servant. Uh, Scott is the only speaker in this present COAC to have uh, uh, presented at the last, so he's the keeping this legacy alive of, of the modern COAC uh, speakers um, uh, with this topic, uh, Carl Muller, forgotten master of 19th century sculpture. So please uh, help me introduce Scott H. Miller. Oh, thank you. Thank you to uh, our sponsors, everybody who's here. Uh, allows me to sort of babble on for a bit. You probably noticed that Jesse was uh, very careful to throw that H in my name a lot. And for those of us who have really common names as a way of distinguishing ourselves, which is something we're going to discuss in just a minute. So you're all probably just saying, who's Carl Muller? At one time, he was somebody who was reasonably well known, uh, pretty much forgotten today. But we will deal with that. Because it's sort of one of those things when you think about artists, They're, they come in, successful artists come in various groups. There are those who sort of have this sad uh, history where they do well during their lifetimes and then towards the end of their life or shortly after they die, they're completely forgotten and nobody knows who they are. Um, there are starving artists who are never known until after they die. And then of course, everybody who bought their art does very well. And then there are a few that are successful and well-known during their lifetimes. And after they die, they continue to stay well-known. I'd like to say Muller is one of those. Obviously he's not. But to make matters even worse, not only is he pretty much not known, but when he is remembered today, his name is almost invariably mangled so that it's unrecognizable. So hopefully we will correct that to some extent. Uh, I'll use this. Okay. There we go. Okay. So one of the great, that's Carl Muller over there. One of the great difficulties in attributing work to Muller is his name. During his lifetime, he used a variety of spellings, and some of them are up there. Uh, Carl with a C, Carl with a K, Charles, uh, last name is Miller, Muller, Muller, I mean, all sorts of variations. And then there is Carl L. H. Muller. For a, while, for a while, I thought, where does this come from? It doesn't show up any place. I eventually did find it in a few pieces of porcelain that he did when he was working for the Union Porcelain Works. The problem is that I can't find anything to indicate what L stands for, what H stands for, or that they were even his names. He did use it, but his the legal documents like his will have no mention of it. So the question to some extent is, why did he use all these names? He had an older brother, Nicholas, who came to this country with him. They worked on a number of uh, projects together and Nicholas only used one name. No versions other than Nicholas, Nicholas Muller. Well, okay, uh, well, before we get to the next slide, you can see here are a bunch of the signatures that he's used over and over again. Uh, and on the right hand, top right, you can see some of the uh, census records. And one of the fun things is there's Carl Miller up on top, who's 48 years old in 1870. And in 1880, he's uh, 63 years old. Now we can contrast that a little bit to, with his stepdaughter, who was 33 in 1870 and 10 years later is only 40. So 
Close enough for government work, but not very good for the researcher. But here's what, the reason that I think Carl used so many names is this. It's a common name. I can sort of sympathize with that. And it might have been that he wanted to avoid being confused with Carl Miller. Um, actually, these don't really line up well, but that's Carl Muller there on the left, Leopold Carl Muller, and Charles Louis Muller, uh, all painters. And I will have to speak to somebody who <laughs> decided my slides were good the other day. Um, anyway, our Carl Muller did leave something of a paper trail. We can figure out a little bit about his life. Uh, although, even when we do find things out, generally it's contradictory. So our Carl was born in Koblenz on the Rhine in 1820. His father, William, was a goldsmith. And after attending the Royal College of Koblenz from about 1830 to 38, Carl worked in his father's shop for a while. And then he went to France for about three years where he studied at the Royal Academy of Paris and under uh, David Danger, who's there in the center. Uh, he was a fairly well-known sculptor of the time. We here know him mostly for his long series of medals of contemporaries. And that's just one example there on the right from the a &S collection. Uh, after those three years, he returned to Germany, got a release from military service, spent several years wandering around touring his own country, and then returned to France, supposedly at the request of the sculptor Francois Ruda, who is known for his work on the Arc de Triomphe over there. You can see that um, it's the departure of the volunteers of 1792. While he was in France at this point, he spent four years working on a sculpture called um, the Mistral Scars. And this was a sculpture that brought him a lot of fame and a medal from the Royal Academy. For some reason, that medal received a lot of attention in this country, and not for a good reason. So that's the Minstrel's Curse over there, 1847, and it was based on a popular poem of the time. And I will sort of take pity on everybody and not recite it. But it's a fairly short one, and you might want to look it up at some point. So the early accounts about this medal is that Muller received a second uh, class award. And the early announcements in this country seem to support that. So we have on the top over there the Evening Post of September 16, 1850. And you can see that it's very clear this work of art received the second prize at last year's National Exhibition of Fine Arts. About 10 days later, all of a sudden, it's now the great gold medal. So we have great inflation here, but we don't really know why. But this became something that uh, garnered a lot of attention, a lot of debate, people uh, discussing it for some reason. And then eventually, there was an article published in the American Art Union of October 1850. And in that uh, article, it was shown that the great gold medal was actually given to Jules Cavalier for his statue of Penelope there on the left. And there were two second class medals given. One went to Auguste Preau for Christ, which you see on the right, as well as some other works and also one to our friend Carl for the menstrual's curse. So you, you think that would settle things. Ever since that article came, came out, almost everybody who discussed this credits Muller with the gold medal. So I'm not sure what the problem there is, but we also have the same issue with Muller's coming to the United States. Early accounts indicate that Carl came here about 1850 after he received many invitations to bring his celebrated sculpture with him. And that's, that sculpture that we just saw a minute ago was shown at the National Academy of Design and later at the 
near Crystal Palace. And look at something else for a minute. Problem is that in 1891, there was another article that came out, uh, and this was more about Nicholas, his brother, than about Carl, but discussed both of them as well. And it claims that at that point, uh, they really came here because of the problems in Europe in 1848. The revolutions were going on, they're going on in France, they're going on in Germany, and it seemed a lot safer for them to come here. So they did. And that really sounds a lot more likely as to what happened. Uh, in any event, they were here, and by uh, 1849 or 50, they, the two brothers established a firm here, CNN Muller. Uh, of the two of them, Carl was the artist, Muller, and um, Nicholas was the founder. And there were then reports uh, that Carl went back to Europe. It seems that Carl had this idea of being this great sculptor and believed that there would be a lot of opportunities for somebody to make fine art here. And he was somewhat disappointed, so he returned to Europe. If he did go, he didn't stay very long because in 1852 to three in the New York directory, we do find both of the brothers here, both living and working. Uh, so Carl is a little bit disappointed he can't do these big monuments that he might have expected. So he turned his attention to some more popular works, things that could be re reproduced as small sculptures by his brother who had the foundry. And Nicholas, the brother, uh, specialized in small household objects, especially clock cases. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But in the meantime, we should discuss the uh, demand for art at the time. And the biggest demand were for these small uh, figural groups that people, middle class people could put into their homes. The best known is the one there in the center by John Rogers. Rogers groups were these fairly nice, reasonably well done plaster groups that were affordable that were in every middle class house with any pretension to artistic leaning. But while he was the most prolific of these, John Rogers was not the only one. So there on the left, uh, over there, is uh, the a blacksmith that that Muller did uh, and his brother cast. And on the right, this one over here was by that other guy we may have heard a little bit later, Daniel Chester French. This is what he was doing in the 1860s. Uh, like Carl Nicholas used modern technologies was something both of the brothers were very much involved with and there was an article in the keystone which was something that later morphed into the torological review but it noted that nicholas muller and his brother carl together were among the first to make zinc castings and gave them a solid bronze appearance through the use of bronze electroplating so it's something we should keep in mind that Carl was always at the forefront of using the new technologies in order to do these popular sculptures that he did. Uh, the brothers uh, collaborated on a number of works. The most popular ones were probably those that relate to baseball. So these are two uh, sculptures. They usually come together and face each other just didn't feel like uh, turning them around. And yes, these are from U Yale University, in case anybody uh, cares here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we can see the two, uh, the batter and the pitcher. Uh, they're about 10 or 11 inches high. And there is an edge from the period. You can see, we just saw the blacksmith. Uh, that and a sculptor together went for $17. This pair over here, uh, was $16, and I've seen these both in, reportedly by museums in bronze or in bronzed zinc. Another uh, baseball-themed piece that they did is this one here on the center, uh, which is probably Muller's uh, best-known clock case. And it's generally regarded as representing baseball past, present, and future. Uh, and just as I said, uh, Muller did a lot of these clocks. He was well known for it. His brother was well known for making it. There is an ad over there 
uh, or just mentions that we have the latest of Carl's designs. But over here, we can see in the center over here are two uh, sports writers. And this represents baseball past. Those writers are identified as um, Henry Chadwick, who's holding a notepad. He was an early sports writer and, and invented the box score. And the one on the right is supposedly Alexander Cartwright, who was an early player. Over here on the left is a batter who is uh, from the Brooklyn Atlantics. And the picture over here is from the New York Mutuals. The children who we can see at the top represent baseball future. So that's past, present, and future. There on the left, and you finally see a small that did make some medals. Uh, <laughs> this over here we'll discuss in just a second, but around that that's here in the collection at the ANS, and that's set in a frame which very much mirrors the clock cases that Muller was working on at the time. So we said Muller was a student under David Danger and Obviously, while he was there, he would have learned how to model and to cast metals. Uh, and Carl did a number of cast metals, but they seem to all have been done around 1855, 1856, maybe another year or so. Three here at the ANS include on the left a self-portrait from 1855, and we can see there's Charles Muller right there and these two unidentified portraits. I have a feeling based on what he was doing and a picture of Nicholas done very late in life uh, that these represent hmm, uh, Nicholas and Nicholas's wife, Eliza. Around the same time, 1856, Nick, uh, Carl was apparently commissioned by uh, Chauncey Derby, who was president of the Cosmopolitan Art Association, to create a series of portrait plaques of uh, well-known Americans. And we can see several of them over here. And these exist also uh, reportedly in both zinc and in bronze. Uh, these three are Washington there on the left, and that's uh, Daniel Webster in the center over there, and that's obviously Benjamin Franklin. Carl was married twice during his lifetime. The first was October 2nd, 1854. His wife, Mary, was the daughter of John Matthews, the Soda King. The ceremony, here we go, was performed by the fashionable Universalist minister, Edwin Hubble Chapin. Chapin uh, had pretensions of being something of a writer, and his best known poem was something called uh, The Ocean Buried. That particular poem has been reworked a number of times, eventually it was set to music, and it is something that a lot of you probably know it's called Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie. If you don't, uh, I recommend the version by Fields Ward. That's the one I grew up with. Uh, Mary, unfortunately, uh, died fairly young. Uh, Carl lived with Mary in the Muller house, in the Matthews household. Um, Carl maintained a studio there. Uh, the home was at First Avenue near East 26th Street. Uh, there was a fire that took place in 1855. Among the damage was about was several fine pieces of sculpture that were in uh, Carl's rooms there. Carl and Mary had one daughter, also named Mary. Unfortunately, she died uh, five days after birth. Uh, just a week later, uh, Mary, the wife, died of consumption. And that's the marker at her uh, cemetery in Greenwood in Brooklyn. Uh, 
Mary is buried next at basically the Matthews family plot, the center of which is a large monument that Carl did for his father-in-law some years later. Um, you can see that over there. Uh, the marriage only lasted a few years before Mary died, but the relationship between Carl and the Matthews family uh, continued for basically the rest of Carl's life. Uh, Carl uh, in a, did this uh, monument for his father-in-law in 1873, which is three years after his father, where after John Sr. died. Uh, on the left, that's a uh, picture that was taken shortly after the monument was put into place, 1873, it took three years to do. And it was one of the landmarks at the time. Today, it's fairly run down. It hasn't weathered very well, but uh, it's still there and it's worth seeing. And over there are the other family members, including Mary, whose uh, slab we saw just a few minutes ago. But Carl stayed on good terms and he continued to make pieces for the Matthews family and firm for the rest of his life. Uh, this over here has one piece that we really should look at and just this. This, just you know, is the canopy over here. And down here is the figure of John and he's looking up at the canopy. And part of it that has so the test of time and is still easily visible is this the uh, depiction of the sculptor at work and right and overlooking that sculptor is this head of liberty, which is very similar to one that will show up on tokens that Carl did for the Matthews family. And you can see it right over there. So um, the tokens that Carl did are probably the most common uh, of his works that are there, and it's also the best known numismatically. He did uh, three different tokens. The first one is the store card from 1876, has the portrait of Liberty on the obverse, along with uh, the eagle head at the bottom and a dolphin uh, to the left, and the reverse is just a simple inscription. Uh, Next one comes about in 1876, the centennial year. We see that the uh, Liberty Head is used again. And here we see the logo of the John Matthews Apparatus or Soda Water Company, which is this child with a wrench attacking a bear trying to get a drink out of a soda tank. This comes out a lot. Same year, we saw that we see the same uh, image on another token that was issued, and this is paired with reverse for R. H. Macy. That's the same Macy that is still in business uh, with the store on Thirty Fourth Street, and the same the star in the center is the Macy logo. It's a fairly well known token, but somewhat uh, enigmatic in that. These show up with a lot of different numbers superimposed on the star. And while catalogers keep putting this in, it's, it's well known, it's very collectible. No one has ever figured out or discussed what the purpose of the token is. You know, it could have been that it was good for a drink. It could have been just an advertising piece. We don't know. But the, the fact that there are so many different numbers is what sort of leaves a lot of questions unanswered about this. A um, couple of other pieces that Muller did for the Matthews family are these two. The one on the left uh, shows John Matthews, who has had died in 1870. And this was done on the 50th anniversary of the firm in 1882 and shows the familiar logo that we've just seen. And a year later, when John Jr. died, uh, a similar one was made as a memorial piece, uh, coupled with the same 1882 reverse. Uh, 
1861, Muller joined the Artist Fund Society of the City of New York. It was an organization established in 1859 uh, and maintained the fund for the aid of its members in distress and for the families of deceased members. The society required each member to give a piece of work annually for an auction. Uh, the proceeds went for this fund for distressed artists and families. So if we look at the auction catalogs, we get some idea of what Muller, what, uh, Muller was doing. 1873, he submitted a statue in marble called the Dreamer. And three years later, a statuette of the actress Charlotte Cushman. I don't have these, but we will see that later on, Muller did a porcelain medal of Charlotte Cushman while he was working at the UPW, Union Porcelain Works. There is just an the catalog from the Matthews Company and shows that same logo that they used for many years. Muller never was a member of the National Academy of Design. We don't know why, uh, but there's no indication he ever joined and the Academy itself says they have no record why he wasn't, but they really liked him. He exhibited there a lot, and in 1863, October 21st, 1863, the cornerstone of the new National Academy building went, was laid. And these are the contents over here. There are five pieces of work by Karl Muller. Three medals, two things that could have been medals, could have been pictures, we don't know. But he is the only artist whose work is specifically listed in this thing. And yet he was never a member. Among the pieces put into that cornerstone is this uh, medal of Asher Durand. Uh, and then there, down there it says Model Union League, that's actually metal. Uh, there were a couple of pieces done at that piece at that time. Uh, that's one of them, to get an idea of what it looked like. That one is not by Muller, but we see two things here, The Minstrel's Curse and New York Fireman. Uh, it could have been a medal, could have been a picture, could have been a small statue, a reduction. We just don't know. There's no record. Um, let's see. Okay, next. I mentioned a little bit earlier that Carl and Nicholas were both involved in new technologies. Well, Muller, among the other things, Muller was an, interested in the electrotype process, which ha, was fairly new, it was invented in 1838, came to the United States in 1841. And it was something that allowed Muller to make metals both inexpensively, but also very large. Uh, and starting about 1859, he began a series of metals using the electric type process in order to make the metals. And probably the first, or possibly, is this one, the Harson metal. And this got a lot of attention in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And most of that attention came from Malcolm Storer who was a well-known collector of medical medals. He's pictured here on the right, and that plaque is actually in the next room, in the Sage Room right next door. If you want to take a quick look before you leave today. Uh, so there we see Har Dr. Harson there on the left. And here is an image of um, a teacher and a group of uh, teaching and medical students and uh, lecturers who are observing and a patient. A lot of discussion starting in 1891 as to who those people are. It got revised several times by Dr. Stora. It'll be in the written version of this. You don't want to hear the list of who those people are. But I will suffice to say that we don't know the name of the patient. So, you know, he's the central character here, but he's the only one we don't know about. 
One of the great things about using electrotypes is that it allows you to make really large metals. At this time, doing a metal in three or four inches was difficult uh, using the striking machinery at the time, but not hard to do if you, as electrotypes. There are also some things about the technology of how Muller put these together that's worth mentioning. Most of the electrotype uh, coins and metals coming out at the time were copies that were made for collectors. You would ha have the two sides uh, made by electrotype, trim them, fill them with lead, put them together, and you can usually see a seam along the edge. Sometimes that seam is smoothed out a, a little bit, so a collector gets duped into buying something that really isn't very good. Uh, but what Muller did is use this to create the metal itself as an original work of art. And rather than put a seam along the edge, he used that wide rim as a collar. And over here is where the seam is for the side. Uh, the next one that he did, or at least the same year, not sure which one came first, were two medals of Schiller. Uh, 1859 was the centennial of Schiller's birth, and Muller did two medals for it, both electrotypes. One I know about from a couple of catalog listings. It has a portrait on one side and a vertical inscription on the other. This is the second one very happy to find it. it was located quite by accident by looking for something else in one of the trays here at the society uh and again you know it has that wide rim over here which allows them to put a seam down here there's schiller uh but the reverse is sort of odd it doesn't quite we don't really understand what this has to do with schiller the um woman with the liar is standing there on one side and faces Brother Jonathan. Brother Jonathan is an early version of what later became Uncle Sam. And, fate, and next to Brother Jonathan are uh, things in, indicative of American culture and manufacture. We have cotton, we have a sewing machine, Mark. It's a sling, sling from, it's over there, the sewing machine. And that, Early product placement, those are soda tanks yeah. from the John Matthews Company. We know that because Matthews, New York is right there. Make no mistake. The best known of Muller's medals, and realize none of these things are common. The Harson medal is common. None of these others are. This is the next one's that were done were for Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens. And they do show up occasionally. Uh, the proposal for these two medals uh, was made at a meeting of the Chamber of Commerce of the State of New York on June 6, 1861. All of the reports say the Chamber of Commerce never says New York City or State, it's New York State. It was introduced on behalf of, of a distinguished gentleman whose name was not given, but it was done to have the chamber honor the gallantry of the garrison at Fort Sumter. Okay. The original motion was to honor the men, not the officers. They were very specific and they discussed it, saying that officers in the army have a number of opportunities for recognition, the men don't. And it was meant only for Fort Sumter. Well, this is politics. So there are a lot of amendments and there's a lot of horse trading. It eventually came that we're doing Fort Sumter and we're doing Fort Pickens, which was about the same time, but nowhere near as important. And we're going to have the officers as well as the enlisted men and privates go into this. So October 3rd, 1861, there is a meeting at the Chamber of Commerce. And we're talking about lengthy titles Jesse, you have a title that's this long. Mr. A.C. Richards of the Committee for Procuring Medals for Presentation to the Soldiers at Fort Sumter and Pickett's gave his report. 
that said that a sum of $1,500 would be needed for the 168 medals that were required for distribution. By April of 1862, the medals were completed and were, and the 168 medals, I guess, were delivered. There were a total of eight versions. The first class medals, which would be to the commanding officers, were six inches in diameter. That could not be struck using the presses at the time. Lecture type, no problem. Uh, the second class, the second class medals are four and a half inches. Those are to be given to the officers. We then had third class medals and fourth class. These are three and a half and two inches to give to the non-commissioned officers and to the privates. This is the first version, preliminary version that Muller did for the Fort Sumter Medal. And there is a portrait of Major Anderson. Soon after uh, Fort Sumter, he became General Anderson, but uh, for the most part, we'll call him Major because that's what the presentation refers to. This is 100 millimeters uh, electrotype. Obviously, it is based on a photograph and it shows a woman weeping. It's actually not all that great. It's okay, but not very inspired. Fortunately, it's just a preliminary, preliminary design. Muller actually went to Chicago to meet with Major Slemmer, then Major Slemmer, he was lieutenant at Fort Pickens. He did a, did a life sitting, he did a life sitting with Anderson, came up with better, with at least things a little more appropriate, better designs. Uh, the entire project took Muller and several assistants five months. This is the finished product for the uh, officer's medal. There are slight differences between the first and second class, usually in the inscription uh, on the reverse. So this is the one, uh, the six inch side given to uh, Major Anderson and the reverse over here. And this is great because we have official descriptions of this. So a little condensed version is uh, the genius or guardian spirit of America arising from Fort Sumter. Uh, wounded by the insults of the country's honor, she seizes the starry symbol of the nation and with the flaming torch of war calls aloud for loyal men to protect it. Uh, the enlistment got uh these the third and fourth class medals and they show the fourth with um peter hart on the reverse affixing the flag to the flagpole we'll mention him in just a second he was not a soldier so the medal for major anderson was given to him at a ceremony at the chamber of commerce may 1st 1862 there was a list of all the recipients published the day before in the newspaper. And I know coin people like hearing lots of vintage figures and all that. So we do have that. So the awards were first class Fort Sumter to Major Anderson. Nine second class officer awards were given, including one to was <clears throat> to be given to Richard K. Mead, the second lieutenant of the engineers who has since deserted to the rebels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the remaining officer is the one that we know today, of course, is Abner Doubleday of baseball fame. Uh, there were 23 medals of the third class to non-commissioned officers and 52 to privates. Peter Hart was given one of the private medals. Peter Hart was a New York City policeman. He was there because he had escorted Mrs. Anderson to the fort just before the battle took place. During the battle, he is the one who went and reattached the flagpole with the flag on it. And that's why he's depicted here. He's eventually, I think, a sergeant in the New York City Police Force, and there's lots written about him, which will be for another day. Um, but of the privates that were given that day, there's also a John LaRoche. He's listed as having deserted April 22nd, 1861. I assume from what we know of the time, Meade and LaRoche didn't get their medals. 
At least I hope not. <laughs> Medals for uh, Fort Sumter had different designs. They all have Adam Slemmer on the obverse, again, a life portrait. And uh, again, just like the Sumter medals, we have four different, same four different sizes, two for officers, two for non-commissioned and privates. Uh, the reverse here for the officers show Cerberus or the monster of war chained to Fort Pickens, while for lower ranks, the reverse shows a view of the fort in bold relief. Which is over here. Then first Lieutenant Adam Slemmer, then Major Slemmer, who got his first class Fort Pickens medal. Only one second class officer was awarded because there was only one other officer at the fort. Uh, that was second Lieutenant Jeremiah Gilman. There were 12 third class awards and 38 fourth to privates. The Chamber of Commerce once owned a double case, double case sets of both of these medals. So if we start looking at these numbers, uh, <clears throat> we can take the number of medals that were awarded, including the two that were supposed to have been awarded, may or may not have been. Uh, the newspaper puts these guys in. Uh, Joe Levine at... Uh, we used to own presidential coin and antique, said those two guys never got their medals. But if we add the 16, we get a total of 153 medals. And we know 168 were paid for for those $1,500. So I'm assuming that the other 15 medals went to various VIPs. I also assume that Muller uh, kept some for himself. And he may have been able to sell a few, so that the total number probably is 200 uh, or so medals altogether. The reason I think that Mull could have sold medals is this listing from Atnally's Numus Graphics. Uh, it is a two-page price list of Carl Muller's that says description of the Sumter and Pickens medals with price list. So the possibility, I've never been able to find a copy of this. Can't be sure, but I'm assuming that based on this, it, it, there is a good possibility that a few of them may have been sold. It's possible that a few may have has that. <laughs> there are a few other medals done at the time. One of them uh, is this one here for Colonel Ellsworth, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth. Uh, who once worked in Lincoln's law firm and was at the White House, uh, was the first Union officer killed during the Civil War. So the story is that from the White House, they could see in Alexandria the uh, large Confederate flag flying from the Marshall House. Ellsworth went down to tear that flag down. He was killed at the Marshall House. So this medal was made and it shows uh, Colonel Ellsworth from a very well-known image. There were lots and lots of souvenirs and images of the time. There were the patriotic covers, there were uh, musical, uh, there were songs and sheets about him, postcards, everything. And on the reverse, we can see a fireman next to a hydrant. And that would be a reference to the one to the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry Re Regiment that Ellsworth uh, had organized, known as the Fire Zwaves, because most of the, uh, or all of the people who joined that regiment were in the fire department, various uh, volunteer organizations. There was also a small sculpture of a fireman that Muller did that I don't have a picture of at the moment. These two, uh, you know, the last of the Civil War pieces are sort of interesting in what got me uh, started on Muller in the first place. <clears throat> These are fairly large, thick, heavy metals of two brothers, N. Coleman Hart and R. Stewart Hart, sons of a Westchester, New York lawyer. Both men died in June of 1861. 
you can see that's uh, Coleman here. That one is Stewart. The funny thing is the reverse inscriptions, and this is a bit odd. Never un really understood completely. I'd make a few guesses. This one indicates that it's to N. Coleman Hart, and and it's a tribute from his friend John Matthews Jr. Carl Muller's brother-in-law. So they are obviously very good friends. And the ch there's a good chance that Muller knew this guy because he resided in the Matthews household for a very long time. They were and they stayed on very close terms. Uh, Coleman Hart was a lawyer who died uh, 25 years old of uh, got the disease, but got it here somewhere. In any event, scarlet fever. His brother, who was 22, had enlisted in the Union Army and died very soon thereafter of measles. This inscription is from his father, soaking from his father, Robert Hart. So these were obviously done at the same time, at the same time as the Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens medals, but they were apparently paid for by two different people. Moving past the war, Muller continued his occasional work for the Matthews. Oh, just before we, actually before we move on, this gives you an idea of just how thick these medals are. They're not of uniform thickness. This is one of the thicker ones, but it's five and a half, almost five and a half inches diameter. It's almost 20 millimeters thick. So <clears throat> Muller continued his work for the Matthews, too many M's here. Uh, this is a panel in, at the Brooklyn Museum, and it shows there's a guy here in a sleigh pulled by two reindeer. Inside the sleigh is a soda tank. I don't know. And over he back here somewhere is a polar bear peeking out over the um, over one of the mountains. This was used here. That's the base of a statue that was on exhibit in the 1873 exhibition in Vienna. And we can see that over here as well. It also tells us that the polar bear was associated with these cold drinks long before a certain Georgia company began to use that. It was actually in like an Arctic polar cold drink company at the time. So it's something that dates back to the 1850s or 60s at least. Okay. Can I figure what I did here? In 1874, Muller was hired by the Union Porcelain Works of Brooklyn, New York. They're in, Green, they're in Greenpoint. And that was in order to improve the artistic quality of their work. And one of the things I wanted to do was show pieces at a lot of international exhibitions. Uh, the first, or one of the first he did is the Centennial Vase shown over here. There was also a pedestal that was created to put uh, the vase on. And that's where that impression that I showed earlier where it says uh, KLHM uh, came from. So over here, we have Washington, we have all sorts of figures uh, of American history. Uh, and down here, we have some reliefs also of American history, but it's basically the same thing he was doing on his medals. It's that relief work. Uh, and I said, as I mentioned, Muller liked his new technology. Electricity is the new thing. Uh, Muller did quite a number of pieces for them. He reused uh, some of his imagery on several occasions. And here we have a jug showing uh, King Gambrinus. 
the invent the supposedly inventor or king of beer and he is giving he's there with his well-known goat I'm not sure why this arrow shows up uh and there's brother jonathan who also showed up earlier on the schiller medal and there we have the polar bear again I mentioned Mueller stayed on good terms with the Matthews Company. He did those medals up until at least until 1883. Well, this I'm guessing was probably done about the same time, 1882, the centennial of the company, and also done at the Union Porcelain Works. And there is the Mueller, not the the Matthews Company logo of the kid with the wrench attacking the bear who is trying to get a drink of soda. Almost there. <laughs> Muller was always innovating, always playing with technologies. While he was at Union Porcelain Works, he created metals and bar reliefs out of porcelain. So here we have, uh, there was a series of, of these six inch octagonal metals that he did uh, while he was working there. And that's Edwin Forrest. Uh, who was a very well-known actor of the period, actually a bit, little bit earlier period, uh, Charlotte Cushman, who he had that statue that was shown earlier, that was mentioned earlier from the um, auction, and that is the son of the founder of the Union Porcelain Works. His name was Charles Smith. And I actually have an ending here, so I should find that. Yes. Okay, the 27th annual sale of the Artists Fund Society, I'd never remember that, was held January 11th to 12th, 1887. And this was the last auction in which uh, Muller participated. He had a 10 inch statue entitled Childhood, cast in real bronze, and it sold for $60. Muller died unexpectedly of heart disease March 19th, 1887 and is buried in Trinity Church Cemetery and Mausoleum here in New York. He's next to his sister-in-law, Eliza, and near his brother, Nicholas. Despite his formal training and abilities, Muller never really got to be the fine monumental sculptor that he wanted to be. Uh, possibly he was a little bit too early had he waited. Been around a few years later, he would have been here during the American Renaissance when there was this increased uh, awareness and uh, desire for artistic output and a lot more money for it. But he still was able to be creative, uh, readily and steadily employed. Uh, he created sculptures, metals, decorative household objects, porcelains, and we're lucky now we can probably get his name straight and remember it. So thank you, everybody who helped. Thank you, Any questions? Yes. Why such a large? Oh, okay. Why such a large metal? Like twenty millimeters. Uh, it, was, it was very thick. You, well, he was doing a very large metal. They, they had to do, they, they thought they, instead of using, say, gold, silver, bronze, pewter, whatever, for different ranks, Chamber of Commerce, I guess, decided they wanted these massive different metal. sizes. They could make, I mean, we were making big metals. We were just starting, think of, like, the General Grant medal was four inches or so from Congress. Bigger is better. So Chamber of Commerce is doing these bigger ones. And they could. Uh, it was when the first ANS medal came out, about a three inch medal for Abraham Lincoln after he died. Striking it was a problem. Yeah. But if you're using electrotypes, no, I know that. there was no side. Matter of fact, there was one medal that he did of um, Samuel Morse. I've never seen it. But supposedly, at, there used to be these Morse celebrations every year. And at one of them, there was a life-size relief of Morse 
that Muller did, which is probably just a large electrotype of the metal. You could do it any size and it's affordable. Remember, 168 medals cost $1,500, including the artwork, mm -hmm. uh, expenses, the, le the cases that came with it. That's cheap. Uh, what did one of these weigh? Uh, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I, ha I haven't weighed them, but uh, I've got four of them in a box yeah. that I've tucked away. And when I brought them in for photography, it was sort of like... <laughs> It was heavy. I'm assuming several pounds each. But just you, you've carried them. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're quite heavy. Yeah. Stephen's trying to pick it up with one hand. So that's fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Any other questions, comments? I don't know if we have any online. Uh, it'll just appear on the screen magically. Are there any others in the house? A couple minutes left. Yes. What happened to the soda company? To, to which company? The soda company. Oh, they eventually merged into a larger conglomerate of soda companies. And I think they're sort of out of business. But at, with the later um, amalgamations of these companies, I know they were around at least World War II or so. But if you, if you do, if you try to Google, you know, uh, John Matthews apparatus, you see just how these companies eventually did all come together at one point. I mean, we have one comment, but I believe it's actually for Neil, right? Is this for you? Uh, I, I can probably so. help you tie the 1834 wig token and the Foyt Bonder token together independently of the dial and can do the letter. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in touch. Excellent. Uh, any other comments? Yes. With regard to the electrotype, uh, did he use a fill in there? Yes. There so, what is it a lead fill, lead, or is, which is why they're so heavy? Yes. And we have, and we know for sure that's lead besides the weight, because I've seen a couple of examples where the seam was breaking, and you can tell what's inside. And to tie this together with some other presentations, uh, we had one that mentioned the Hill pantograph and another the mm -hmm. Kantzman pantograph. And these are obviously being enlarged or reduced via the pantograph because the portraits on the six inches are exactly the same as the ones that are on the two yeah. inch. So, so uh, mixing various forms of technology as well. Any other last minute uh, questions, comments? All right, we're going to move on to the final presentation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.